the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudate Jesus Christus. I'm Timothy S. Flanders. This is the Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Cameron O'Hearn. Cameron, how you doing, brother? Good. It's O'Hearn, like hernia. O'Hearn. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Should have Cam- mentioned that to you, my bad. <laughs> yeah. well, Cameron O'Hearn is the owner and creative director of Sacred Stories, a documentary film business that helps nonprofits raise money by telling stories of the lives they change. He acquired a Bachelor of Divinity from Mary Vale. Institute of England and wrote his dissertation on the liturgy. He's also the director of the upcoming documentary, Mass of the Ages, How Tradition Will Restore the Church. But his greatest accomplishments are his wife, Amber, and his four children. They I accomplished attend- that wife. Yeah. <laughs> well, you married her. <laughs> you got her to marry you. So that's your it. accomplishment. You got four <laughs> kids out of it. So excellent, excellent. So you guys are in Dayton. Uh, yeah. So tell me about, tell me a little bit more your journey to the dad trad. What is a dad trad exactly? Is that mean <laughs> traditional, traditional Catholic who's a dad, well, trad dad? Yeah, every so often. So you've heard rad trad. It used to be like a pejorative term, but now it's a badge of honor. Um, radical traditionalist. Um, and there's so many words that rhyme with trad. So I'm just running with it. There's dad trad, <laughs> plaid trad. Like there's all kinds of words. So. We go well, you're, what, are, you, are you of Aunt Irish extraction, Mr. O'Hearn? I'm one of them, yes. One of them, excellent. Yeah. Okay. So you could do some plaid somewhere. <laughs> I guess if you're, you, there's an Irish and a Scottish kilt, am I right? Uh, you're probably right. You, you might know more than I do. <laughs> oh, no. I, I, I assure you I do not. So, so tell me about, uh, your, were, you, were you raised Catholic, Cameron? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Raised in an excellent Catholic family, um, my mom would get my dad to pray the rosary often <laughs> to lead us in praying the rosary. Um, my dad, an excellent example of the faith, just lived every day like a solid Catholic man, hardworking. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, Catholic church every week. Uh, sometimes during the week, I remember going to. Uh, every month we would go to confession with a holy hour and benediction once a month, and then we'd get ice cream afterwards. Um, great Catholic family. I didn't discover the Latin Mass until I was 23. <laughs> I just didn't know it existed. Um, but our parish wasn't too bad. Uh, Nova Sordo Parish um, had even communion patents, um, male altar servers, and all that. Um, my, but my, my personal faith, like that was my family, you know, passing on the Catholic faith. But when I really bought into it was in high school, um, actually on a Steubenville conference. So a lot of teens get together, uh, do a lot of crazy stuff. And, uh, I was there. It was really exciting. The moment of, uh, adoration and a pres- the procession of the blessed sacrament, I just was hit with the love of God and the reality of his real presence, like right there in front of me. I was just, I just wept on the floor uh, because of my sins. Cause I was a crazy, <laughs> crazy guy in high school. And uh, after that moment, you know, I, I, I fell back into sin in various ways, but it was really the blessed sacrament that took hold of me and kept me in the faith. So you know, I started going to daily mass, daily holy hours, um, spending time with the real presence. And I, I had a profound devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. I realized if, if that is who our faith say, says it is, if that is really Jesus, the King, present there, then my whole life needs to revolve around him. A devotion to the Blessed Sacrament is not just one devotion among many. It's devotion to Jesus in his real presence. So, and it wasn't until, you know, I found the Latin Mass when I was 23 that I found a home for that devotion. I went to Latin Mass and saw priests acting like it. They actually believed it. <laughs> like, that was, that was 
I felt like I was home finally. Like my faith could have its fullest expression here. Um, you know, seeing the priest judiciously caring for every particle of the host and keeping his forefinger and his thumb together after the consecration, kneeling, genuflecting before and after each time he received, or each time, sorry, he touched the blessed sacrament. And then just receiving on the tongue, you feel like heaven is just spilling over <laughs> into earth and over this altar rail. And everything about Lat the Latin Mass points us in the direction of who really matters, Jesus the King. And uh, so, yeah, I had a great family, great Catholic faith. I think typical Novus Ordo experience for a lot of Catholics. Found the Latin Mass at age 23, and my love for the Blessed Sacrament found its home there. That's beautiful. Praise God. So, and it sounds like, it sounds like, I mean, I'm not sure how typical that is, what you, what you had. It sounds like a pretty ideal Novus Ordo upbringing. I mean, as, as, be, as good as it can get. To me, I mean, it sounds like <laughs> what? what you're saying. I mean, you got you had both know. born, raised Catholic. Both of your parents were pious. I mean, uh, there's a lot of horror stories. I mean, and, and many. I mean, it's true that many people are falling away from the faith due to Novus Ordo abuses and whatnot. But it sounds like that's you had one of the best of of the Novus world, Novus Ordo world, Novus world, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> New world order. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, great Catholic family. Yeah, we, we did have an, I would say, an atypical Novus Ordo experience. What I meant by typical was that 99.9% .9 of parishes out there aren't, um, you know, performing the Novus Ordo, the new mass as Vatican II actually intended. So when I say typical experience, I'm thinking of like, you know, priests celebrating versus populum towards the people, no altar rail, um, an ordinary use of extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, those kinds of things. So I think it's typical in the sense of like, man, we have a lot of work to do and a lot of immediate problems in the church in terms of how Novus Ordo is celebrated and that sort of thing. But it sounds like you, because sometimes traditionalists are a little bit too hard on the Novus Ordo in my view, because mm. they, they sort of consider it to be an automatic apostasy sort of thing you know like you, you grow up in the Novus Ordo you're just going to become apostate and that's that you know but you did have a very strong conversion experience thoroughly no in the thoroughly Novus Ordo world um, so how do you look back on your experience as, as sort of growing up in the new mass uh, and what how you see God working there and did you feel some sort of discomfort with your new foreign devotion was there sort of you said you found a home was that uh Something that some kind of discomfort you felt until you found a home. How did that work? Yeah, I mean, so I, I've I've had, so I I find myself in an interesting position, you know, when I, when I would go do donuts and coffee after mass at a traditional mass, and you know, those conversations tend to get into like, who's a heretic, what counselors are valid, um, and and this or that, the other thing. But I find myself sometimes defending Vatican II um, in certain crowds. But I mean, this we could talk about this for hours because w when you say Novus Ordo, like, or when anyone says it, they could mean one of a few different things. They could mean what is actually written in Sacred Sanctum Concilium in Vatican II. They could mean the rubrics, which is like this radical reconstruction of the liturgy uh, authored by Bunini. They could mean the typical Novus Ordo experience, which is even further removed from those rubrics. And I think when people hear Novus Ordo, they think of that third one. They think of just their typical parish experience, which is so far removed from what Vatican II intended. So... Um, yeah, I, I have, I have, um, the, the, here's the way I put it is my experience of coming to the faith at this retreat, uh, was a good thing. And there's a lot of young people who get their faith awakened at events like this. That's planting a seed. Now, the problem is we have a lot of these events that have been going on for 
decades, but we see a steady decline in Catholic belief about the real presence and a steady decline in mass attendance. 23% of young people, young Catholics attend mass. You know, 60% of Catholics who attend mass every Sunday, only 60% believe in the real presence. We have an equivalent of half of the priests that we had in the 50s for the Catholic Church. So I see those seeds as being good and important, but we also need the soil. And I, I think the Latin Mass is the soil for that faith. And that's what I mean for finding a home. I felt like I had this strong devotion to the Eucharist, this strong faith because of my family, because of this experience because of a regular prayer life. Um, but it felt out of place to some degree going to the typical Novus Ordo when the priest is not acting like the Eucharist is the most important thing on earth. Um, the Eucharist is not treated like a king, like it's Jesus here now, Almighty God. When I receive the Eucharist, I come into contact with Almighty God. So that's what I mean by I found a, my faith really found a home in the Latin Mass. I think there's, there's so many problems. There's sm much smarter people than me. I'm not an expert, but I, I see a, a definite difference between what Vatican II intended as a, you know, fallible council, actually. Um, unfortunately, it was convened by John the 23rd, and he said, you know, this, it, we're not going to teach doctrine. This is going to be a pastoral council, um, so it does not have the mark of infallibility. And then Paul VI reiterated that when he took over. So it's, re it's really messy, but I just know that what Vatican II intended, what Bunini did to reconstruct the liturgy was eye-opening to me, just crazy stuff. And I know you know more about that than I do. And then what's typically done at the typical Novus Ordo parish is even further removed from those rubrics, unfortunately. I think the main, the main examples of that are the abuse of using extraordinary ministers ordinarily, of Holy Communion ordinarily, because that affects us. Everything we do at the liturgy especially affects what we believe. So, you know, the ordinary use of extraordinary ministers, not using a paten or an altar rail, to catch uh, the sacred host or particles that fall. That's tragic. We just, <laughs> if any priests are listening, like I would purchase patents. If you don't have an altar rail, purchase patents. Instead of having Bob and Mary and all these people come up to the altar to distribute communion, give them a patent or give your servers a patent. Like let's, let's take steps towards you know, tradition, what we've done for many years, um, including that specifically with the altar rail. But these are really important things. Like, we have to treat the Eucharist with utmost reverence and respect. And I think we can really easily begin to make those changes. Any priests listening, like, why aren't we using patents? Why aren't we, you know, doing mass ad orientum? I know there's a lot of uh, parishioners that will really uh, put you put your feet under the fire if you start doing some of the, some of these things, but it's affecting what we believe. We see the stats. The church teaches as we believe, as we pray, so we believe. Lex orandi, lex credendi. That's Catechism eleven twenty four. The current Catechism of the Catholic Church eleven twenty four. As we pray, so we believe, and this has been you know, trumpeted since the early, early church. So there's a reason why we have a radical loss of faith in the church and we're on the steady decline. And the only place you seem to be seeing revival is at Latin mass parishes, because that's what we want. So let me ask you about one more question, kind of about the Novus Ordo controversy. If we make a distinction between the Novus Ordo typically and the, the most ideal Novus Ordo mass, where everything's done by the book, out of orientum, everything's perfectly done according to rubrics and everything. 
And we take that and we compare that with the Latin mass. I, I, cause I think it's always f a fair comparison to compare the best with the best, the best yeah. on either side. That's a fair comparison. So why then Cameron, are you not trying to make a documentary to restore the Novus Ordo to the ideal Novus Ordo on the one hand? Why are you trying to do the Latin mass? Um, here's the main reason. And I, I thought of an analogy to kind of wrap my own head around this. Let's say uh, you have a burglar in your house. Uh, middle of the night, someone's in your house ready to take something or hurt you. Now, in that moment, you might imagine that you, you have a bad security system. <laughs> like, oh man, I need a new security system. <laughs> well, one problem is more immediate and urgent. That's the burglar in the house. Deal with this more immediate problem. There's also the problem of a security system and we can deal with that and uh, you know fix that. But uh, one problem just deserves our attention right now. That's why I said, you know, this, this Sunday, like we can start making some of these changes now. But here, here's why I wanna invite people to Latin Mass. It's, it's, it seems like it's going to be a really long, arduous journey to get the current, you know, typical Catholic church, the Novus Ordo attending Catholic population. First for priests to celebrate the mass according to the rubrics, then for the rubrics to be revised according to what Vatican II intended. And then for us to begin to ask the question like, okay, what would be a, a proper enrichment of the Latin mass or the new mass? Like how can we then see both of these side by side? In the meantime, there's a robber at the door. I wanna deal with this problem of yes, liturgical abuse, but just the liturgical beige Catholicism, just this like haphazard way that we go about liturgy and that we treat the Eucharistic King. So, I want to just open the doors to the Latin Mass for the typical Nova Sordo Catholic. Um, that's why I'm actually making this documentary. This documentary, though traditional Catholics like myself are going to love it because it's going to feature the Latin Mass. It's going to be absolutely beautiful. You're going to have experts saying all the things we love to hear and they say them better than we say them. But that's not going to change minds if we just talk about the talking points. Like we need to, we need to, I need to create something for the typical Nova Sorta Catholic, like the threes and the fours who, who attend, you know, who are faithful Catholics otherwise, and they attend the Nova Sorta parish. I just want to open the doors to the Mass. like, look how beautiful this is. And this is actually the heritage of our church. This is like the mass that has been passed down to us. While the Nova Sordo church, you know, Nova Sordo priests and parishioners figure out those problems over there, come to the Latin mass. You will find a solid ground for your faith. Your family will be fed, not just through the Eucharist, but through the preaching and through just the, the symbols and the, the signs and the beautiful architecture and music and everything. So. Yeah, I see it as more of an, like an immediate solution. It's like Latin mass, open the doors, come on in, let's just explode. <laughs> let's just yeah, that's, get that's everyone really, here. Yeah, that's really good because I'm thinking of you know, the, the trajectory of the, the new mass. So Sacrosanctum Concilium, I believe, was 62. And then the Latin edition was completed in 69. English came out in 1970. But the English version was so bad and it was based on faulty principles that they later revised it significantly, I believe in 2012, when the third Roman edition came out in English. So you have a process that took initially seven years to actually get out the Latin version, then another year for an English version, but it was so terrible that it took another uh, 42 years after that. So we're talking about 60 year process to actually get the standard third Roman, like the basic uh, Latin edition that's translated properly 
So, I mean, yeah, that's a really good point just on a very pragmatic level, Cameron, because if we, if we wait another 50 years to try to work out Nova's Ordo, yeah. whatever problem with the, the liturgy, um, what is the rate of decline in the church? I, I know that in the, in the United States, at least, it, the mass attendance was at 75% in like 1950. But that was because the, America was a unicorn in the Catholic world and we were growing it significantly. But still, it was, it was a huge in 1950. Now it's at 23%. So what's going to happen in 20, 30, 40 years when that mass attendance goes even further down? Yeah. Um, so what do you see as... So, I, so that's kind of a short-term solution that you see is the Latin mass. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about... What do you see as a long-term solution? I, go oh, ahead. Man. <laughs> yeah, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in this specifically. I think there's very clear um, immediate solutions if, if priests start celebrating the Mass according to the rubrics themselves. Now there's ambiguity in the rubrics as, as they're read. There's a lot of room for, you know, interpretation or like, you know, there's several parts in the mass where the priest can just ad lib something. So the, there's problems in the rubrics themselves, but I think that's a quick fix that does a lot of good. If imagine if every Nova Sordo parish was doing mass ad orientum, that would do something to the psyche of the church. We would stop like considering the mass to be this community gathering, and the priest instead of <laughs> You know, he's reading the canon out loud in the vernacular for everyone to hear. Instead of him trying to, like, you know, say this prayer to the Father in the person of Jesus so that people in the back can hear. Um, and at a certain point, like, when is he not talking to God and when is he talking to me? It sounds like he's talking to me. It's kind of weird. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. It's a very weird uh, dynamic. If we just have the priest start, doing mass ad orientum, that does a lot of good immediately. Um, and then, you know, restore Catholic art, uh, altar rails, all that, um, all that good stuff. And uh, so that does a lot of good, a lot of immediate good. And then I, I don't know what we do with the rubrics. I don't know what, you know, I, it seems like we need just a new Pope in the future to kind of re rein back in all, all that happened in the 60s and 70s. Because with Bunini, like, it was just a hack work. It was a rushed process. And the mass that took 1,500 years plus to develop and come down to us was reconstructed in, you know, just a handful of years. Um, and Bunini has this interesting analogy that he keeps coming back to now he's he's the uh, secretary at with the concilium and the interesting thing is he had the ear of paul the sixth and he also was a secretary so they would ask him what does paul pope what does the pope want and then the pope would ask what what does the council want what do the people want and he was kind of like he would go back and forth and saying this is what the people want, or this is what the Pope wants. So he was, he had a lot of control. If you, if you look into it and anyways, the, his analogy he keeps coming back to is the, the old mass, the traditional mass is like this really big building, this old building that has like a lot of new rooms built onto it. And like a lot of corridors that aren't very efficient. And what we need to do is like, tear down walls and build up a new, we need to reconstruct it. We need to build it so it's more pleasing to modern man. Now that's so different from what is typically, the analogy typically used for the liturgy. Like Benedict the 16th talked about it as a, a garden that is received, that has been growing for, you know, two millennia. And we receive it and we cultivate it water it, we prune some of the leaves, we cultivate it. The Pope has the you know, primary task of cultivating this garden or a tree. You know, a Saint John Henry Newman had this analogy with the tree. Like the, the tradition is this great tree and it looks like an acorn at the beginning, 
but it becomes a tree eventually. It looks very different and beautiful and it has a lot of complexity to it. Now with the old mansion analogy, I say, amen. I love that the Latin mass is like, has all these mysterious corridors. I feel like I get lost in the mass, but in a good way. Um, and it, you see this, this radical desire for the, the liturgy to be reconstructed and for experiments to be done. Like we need to, we need to multiply activities in the liturgy. We need to explain the liturgy as it's happening. We need to get people engaged and we see the exact opposite happening. When, when people who are on the fringes of the church, who like don't have an otherwise really strong faith, like I was grace to receive from my family and these experiences on retreat and so forth, those people come to the typical Nova Sordo parish and they see priests and parishioners who just aren't taking it seriously. It's like a liturgy that's just, I don't think you, you believe what you're saying. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, the question was, a long time ago, you asked this question, like, how do we you know, get back to square one with the liturgy? I don't know. Um, but would you have anything to add on kind of what I said? We need to, like, we need to remove, a, we need to get back to what Vatican II intended. We need to, like, restore its ideal like vision of you know let's introduce vernacular it may be used in some parts of the mass but latin must be retained like those kinds of ideas so again with the analogy of the robber at the door yes we need a new security system uh let's talk about that security system if you want but it's it's going to take a lot of work and actually we need the to take the analogy one step further I don't know how to install a security system. I need to call the experts to install this security system. But I can handle this, this robber at the door. So priests, like you, you can do a lot at your parish to, to just regain sacrality in the liturgy, even at the Novus Ordo. For, for, I think for the future of the church, it's going to be traditional. Um, young people aren't mixed up with the politics and the history of the Novus Ordo and everything, they don't, they don't see the Novus Ordo as a new thing. They see it as an old beige thing, typically. But when they see the Latin Mass, they discover, they unearth this treasure, and it's a new thing to them. And they realize that this is something that's been around since, since the beginning, and they, they, this is what has been denied them. And like the kingdom of heaven, buried in a field, a treasure buried in a field, and they find it and they sell everything they have to buy that field. What are some of your uh, favorite uh, musical pieces or services in the Latin Mass that have mm -hmm. really t just uh, moved you and uh, impacted your faith? Ah, that's a great question. I, I love, um, what, I, I just joined the Scola this past year. I was was in choir in high school, but it doesn't mean I have a good voice. It's just because I was a guy who didn't mind being on stage. Uh, so I was in the Scola, learned a lot. And I remember this this one day, they, they mentioned this, the mass that saved polyphony. I'm like, wow, that sounds really cool. So I looked up Palestrina's Misa Pape Marcelli, and it's so good. Like the Kyrie specifically. The reason, the reason why it's in our uh, teaser, teaser film where it's the Latin Mass in five minutes was because it just like, it was perfect. It, I love that piece so much. Just the, the swelling of this Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, and how, how it builds and it just cries out for mercy um, as opposed to this, you know, dialogue of, Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. It's just, man, how did we get to that from, from there? Like this mass that saved polyphony. Yeah, anyways, I'm, I'm getting on a soapbox again, but I just want to say I love yeah. Misa Pape Marcelli. Um, I think uh, Victoria has a lot of amazing pieces. In terms of like liturgies, um, I love the... Uh, Rurati masses. Rurati is a hard word to say. It's like brewery. <laughs> but uh, Rurati masses with all the candles. Um, 
I love that there's no light in the church. It's very dangerous. <laughs> it's not very uh, nice, uh, but it's just dangerous and beautiful. And then the Requiem Mass, specifically because that's how uh, funerals should be done, is like pray for this person's soul. That's what I want. That's what any of us want. Like pray for me. Don't talk about how great I was or whatever. Um, like I remember at my dad's funeral, uh, he died two years ago um, in April, April 16th, 2018. And uh, at his funeral, uh, there was a really good priest there, uh, his Novus Ordo. And uh, I was so glad the priest did not say like, let's celebrate his life. Like, that drives me crazy. This, my dad, the best man I know, I, I knew him up close. Like I, I, he served like no one else. Um, just anyone who knows him knows he's just, he's one of a kind. He is now meeting the judge face to face. He's not perfect. He wants me to pray for him. He wants me to. And so when I gave you know, like a little eulogy, I, that's what I ended with. I said, pr please pray for him. Like that's what he wants. That's the best thing you can do for him. That's the most love you can show my dad is, is pray for him. Um, so that's why I love Requiem Masses. We pray for the dead. We don't celebrate them um, and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, what, what about you? Oh, uh, Tenebrae service is my favorite service. Um, okay, remind me what that is again. It's the uh, Miserere May. Um, it's the Good Friday. On Well, it's actually um, starts Wednesday night in Holy Week. It's just the Matin service. Hmm. Um, it's, actually, it's actually not a Mass. It's, it's the Divine Office. Um, yeah. But it uh, has my favorite pieces, Miserere May. By Allegri. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, what, was there a moment that you remember that uh, it sort of clicked for you and you knew you were going to be a trad dad for your, <laughs> for your life? Oh, man. The first time I attended Latin Mass, that's all I needed. Um, so two, I noticed two things. First was, like I said before, proper respect for the Eucharistic King. But the second thing was it was a mass and it was a low mass. Um, it was a mass that I could actually pray at, which was a new thing for me. Um, so is that that moment, you know, uh, just a short aside, uh, Benedict the 16th uh, says that he's kind of bemoaning all this chatter that happens during the mass, not just people talking, but the, how the, priest prays the prayers it's mostly out loud in the vernacular and he says we become overwhelmed at mere words when we should be encountering the word um and we need silence to encounter god that's his language is silence so yeah it's just i'm wearied my attention is wearied by the time i get to the, the consecration at the Nova Soto parish typical Nova Soto parish. Like my attention is wearied. It's just so much talking about God or talking to God. And it's just all out loud. Um, and then, so I find myself at the consecration, just like, Oh man, it's just, <laughs> I'm, I'm weary. But at the Latin mass, Oh, just like the silence. I just sink into it and I can actually pray. And I'm not, it's not this flat linear thing where I have to be paying attention to this word that the priest is saying right now. Um, now the Latin mass has lexical landmarks where he says something and you're like, yeah, you can be with him in that moment. Arate fratres, like, let us pray. Um, but I can, maybe the introit really like hits me. And so I'm praying the introit, you know, up until the consecration, I'm just like letting it sink into me. And so that, that was the moment where it's like, wow, this is something else. I want to keep going to Latin mass. That was also the time where I was dating my uh, future wife and uh, it was harder for her to appreciate the Latin mass. So I remember have met, having many conversations with her and she doesn't mind that I share this uh, about me saying, you know, the Latin mass is better. She's like, you can't say it's better. I said, no, it is because it's, it's more in line with tradition and that's 
we're Catholics. Like we, we embrace tradition or it's, you don't have to worry about rubrics being sloppy or whatever. It's just, um, it's better. And she said, well, then you're saying you're better. I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's better medicine. I'm sick. <laughs> I, I want this medicine for everyone. And so we had those conversations. I think a lot of people can have, especially when it involves family and friends uh, about the Latin mass. And eventually I said, um, I've only said this once, I think in our, we were, we were engaged to be married. So we're, you know, we're in it to win it. And this is the only time I've said this, but I said, this is a non-negotiable for our family. And man, that, that landed really heavy. And uh, it took a few days for us to like begin to talk about, you know, talk about it again and like, okay. And she, she's an amazing, amazing, supportive, holy woman. Um, I don't have that kind of humility <laughs> in me. And she, she just submitted to that. So that, well, you're the father of our family and our future family. I know you will love you love our family and you have what's best in mind for us. Fast forward to today, she can't imagine her like attending anywhere else. Now we attend Nova Soto occasionally throughout the week, but in terms of raising our family with a mass, like we're both completely in. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, I was 23 years old. It was a low mass dating my future wife and then eventually snowballed into maybe a couple months later. It's like, uh, this is an non-negotiable. Like this is where we have to raise our family. Beautiful, beautiful. So, uh, were you done with your uh, liturgy degree at that point? No, I. Okay. I um, I just got out of missionary work, started dating Amber, and uh, at that time I got a job uh, as the video guy for another uh, Catholic ministry and got married to my wife, started studies. So I was doing studies while we were newlyweds and I was, um, you know, started my career basically. And then eventually started my own business. That was his own, own thing, but finally graduated. Uh, I think it was last year. <laughs> it's so hard to remember. <laughs> I have four kids now and um, yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy, but, uh, time flies when you're, when you're loving God and following his will. So the, when did you want to do a documentary? When did this come about? Have you oh, been thinking about this for years or did it sort of come to you? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you, glad you asked that. Um, I was, we were newly married. I think we had one child at the time. So this was 2014. Um, you know, I have a passion for filmmaking. I have a passion for storytelling. I also have a passion for the Blessed Sacrament. I was there in adoration with my wife. And it was one of those moments where you, you sense a very clear message from God. And I heard him, well, first I said, Lord, why doesn't the world know about you? Why aren't Catholics here? Why don't Catholics worship you? Um, we have the greatest treasure in history, um, Jesus incarnate still, um, Jesus at the right hand of the Father with us in the Eucharist. And most Catholics don't believe. So I, I was asking why this is the case. And it, it was this peaceful voice or sense that I got that said, do something about it. So I told my wife uh, about that. And she said, well, uh, message the, the diocese. I was in Minneapolis at the time. And then I did a video for the diocese about Eucharist, Eucharistic adoration. I was like, great. That was awesome. I, got, I, I prayed. I got like inspiration. I did this thing. I did something about it. And then a few years later, um, this Pew Research study comes out. Now, at this time, I had started thinking about like getting into feature length documentaries. My film business is sort of mini documentaries, you know, around 10 minutes or so. Um, 
made one about my dad. There was about 10 minutes. Uh, so I make documentaries, shorter documentaries, but I wanted to break into feature length documentary filmmaking. I said, if I could do one thing, it'd be about the Latin mass. So I had this in the back of my mind. Then the Pew Research study came out, which showed that 69% of Catholics do not believe in the real presence. 69%. I couldn't, I, well, I, in one sense, I could believe it. I remember there's a lot of uh, chatter on Twitter and so forth about like, why, how could this be? And to me, it was just obvious, you know, we're not acting like it. Even, even St. Pope Paul VI said in Evangelii Nunciandi, he said that modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it's because they're witnesses. So we cannot, Monday through Saturday, no matter how good our catechesis is, and this is what people were saying. They're saying, oh, we need better catechesis. Yeah, that's true. Um, or they, they would come up with, with all kinds of things, but they never, they never mentioned the elephant in the room, the burglar at the door. <laughs> the, the, we're not acting like it. It's as simple as that. It, you could have the best catechesis from Monday through Saturday, but if you're not acting like it on Sunday, if dad is not acting like it, if our father is not acting like it, uh, our faith can be strong, but it starts to wear, wear us down. Like if I say to you that communion in the hand causes about one particle for every communicant to fall on the floor, um, you would say, wow, that's, that's, that's crazy, or how do you know that fact? Well, this is in Kwasniewski's new book, um, Reclaiming Our Roman Catholic Birthright. He, he references a study done by Father X. I think he just doesn't want his, I don't know, Father X. Uh, he's a chemist, Father X, and uh, he studied you know, communion on the hand with unconsecrated hosts and found that on average, for let's 100 you know, receptions of communion in the hand, that there's over 100, so about 118 particles that are left over. Now, I don't know about you, but at every Novus Ordo parish I've been at, when people receive on the hand, they're not diligently looking for the particles. Like I was actually taught at my Nova Soto parish growing up was you can receive either, but if you receive on the hand, like check for particles and this and that. But I mean, that's just not the case 99.9% .9 of the time. So I can say something like that. And when priests hear that, or when, you know, Catholics hear that, they can brush it off. And I think the reason for that is because we've just like domesticated our faith and we've softened our beliefs. And, you know, Sunday after Sunday, if the liturgy is expression of our faith, if we see dad not acting like it, then that starts to affect what we believe. We start to come up with excuses like, well, it doesn't really matter or, um, Jesus has, has, you know, Jesus can handle it or, or maybe, you know, he, he somehow magically like, you know, he removes himself from the presence of those particles, which isn't true. Um, and what we, we just don't deal with the facts. We don't, we don't really believe. I think, I think we don't, we believe, but we, we don't really believe. I think that's the problem is yeah. 69% Catholics don't believe. So that means 30, 31% of Catholics do believe, but what are, what's the percentage of those who really believe, who like, who really believe? And uh, so, I, yeah, I think that's, that's the whole thing. I actually forgot what question you asked. Oh, I was just talking <laughs> about the documentary. Yeah. The, yeah. I, so the few research came yeah. out, I said, I heard it again, do something about it. And, you know, I have this background in, in, uh, in like sharing the faith, um, with people and like how to, how to have all kinds of different conversations, depending on where people are at in their faith, whether they're zero or a 10. Um, and I have this background of like, yeah, we're, we're doing a good job planting seeds, but I just need to, I just need to cultivate the soil or I need to, I need these seeds to be planted in good soil. 
here's what I can do about it. I have a passion for filmmaking. I love telling stories. Um, I'm, I'm good at like connecting very disparate like ideas and putting them together in an understandable way. And I'm good at telling stories through the medium of film. So here's what I can do about it. I can make a feature length documentary that draws the connection between the way we worship and what we believe. And that's just church teaching. When people hear that, I said, yeah, that's important. But then they have these other, the other, these other things in mind, like we need better catechesis or we need, um, which we do, or we need to deal with uh, the sex abuse crisis, which we do. But they don't see that the fundamental effect, that the liturgy has the most fundamental effect on our faith, on what we believe. So uh, I can make a documentary that draws this connection. I, I can, you know, hire, fly out the experts. We can make something absolutely stunning that showcases the Latin mass. We can get the right experts to the table and we can tell stories. Now this, this is what's so, this is why documentaries are so effective is because they connect investigation with story. And story is non-threatening. It's just like you connect with this individual, you wanna know what they have to say, you're open to hearing the evidence. So we lead with story and then we bring in the heavy hitters. <laughs> we bring in the experts like Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. I loved his, my interview with him. He's just so, so smart. We bring in these experts to talk about the liturgy and to make this connection absolutely clear. And we're gonna win people over. I, I believe that a documentary is the best way to do this, a feature length documentary that can like go deep and wide with the topic. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's really a feature length documentary on this subject that is produced in a high quality way. Am I wrong about that or are they- I, I don't know of any. I know there's, there's plenty of great, you know, YouTube channels and videos that people have done about this. Um, but like to what you said, you know, the, the Latin mass deserves our, our best in every way, including how we film it, how we showcase it. So that's why I'm running this documentary is because if, if we hit our goal uh, on Kickstarter, we can bring in the big guns. We can do something absolutely stunning. That's why I put my own money forward to actually get this teaser film filmed and get some interviews filmed. Uh, if any of you have seen our five minute Latin mass teaser, it's, it's stunning, it's beautiful. That's because we, we put money where our mouth is and we are like, this is what it could look like. Now, we did that with a few thousand dollars and a lot of volunteers. Now, what, what happens if we have a proper budget for this thing where we can include, you know, high, much more interviews. We can include stories. Um, we can be on location to see masses like Requiem masses or Rurati masses, those kinds of things. Um, and animation, like we, we can really do this right. There's a lot of good Catholic videos out there that get a good number of views but this is for the church. This is for the threes and the fours, the typical Novus Ordo Catholic. This is gonna win them over. And I, I really believe that. That's the power of documentary filmmaking. Absolutely, I, I love it. I think this is an incredibly important project. And for the viewers, making films, are it's very expensive. You have a, yeah. you have a ton of people who are doing, I mean, you, people don't see this because, I mean, you could just, just watch the credits at the end of any movie. I mean, you've got hundreds of people involved doing all sorts yeah. of different things to make this happen. And I love what you're saying. The Latin mass does deserve the highest quality film yeah. to showcase the highly, highest quality earthly thing that man can do on this earth. Hmm. Absolutely. I love it. Uh, so what is the next, can you tell us about where you're at with the funding? What's the next step? How can we support this? Great, let me just look it up. Um, it, it changes every minute. Uh, we, we had a really good last few days. So excellent. Yeah, we're at 41,176. I believe that's uh, 
uh, 40 or 53 percent. So here, here's how Kickstarters work. Usually the first week, especially the first day, you get a lot of interest, a lot of, a lot of excitement. Weeks two and three, not so much. Uh, we're, we're just ending week three and we're going into week four. Week four is usually when a lot happens. So we're really optimistic about the numbers right now. We're going to hit our goal. If, uh, faithful Catholics like you decide to donate. Now, there might be someone watching now who knows someone who could write one check and make this thing happen. I mean, writing a check to make this project happen, this is going to reach millions of Catholics with beautiful examples of liturgy, with expert investigations on the Latin Mass and the, the importance it has. This is a this is a worthy endeavor for a major donor. I think if, if you know someone uh, like that, just send them our, to our Kickstarter page. Let, let the you know, copy and the, the video do the convincing, but just send them, send them to the page. It's at, just go to theliturgy.org forward slash Kickstarter. So we, we were happy enough to get that domain, theliturgy.org, easy to remember. So if you, if you send them to the liturgy.org forward slash Kickstarter, uh, that'll be a great way to support it. Now, now most of the support is actually coming from people like you and me, people who can, who can give 25 or a hundred dollars and it doesn't hurt too bad, you know? So for everyone watching, everyone who will watch this, yeah, consider giving if you haven't, uh, the, the more people that give, you know, in the next couple of days, the more momentum we have in this last week. Now, here's an exciting announcement, Timothy, that I'm, I'm just, this is for your audience to hear first. We have a generous donor who wants to see this happen. It's actually a group of donors. We, we've compiled some money. We have $10,000 as a matching gift for the next almost a week. So through Sunday evening, midnight, this donor will match beginning now, 12.08 PM Eastern time. <laughs> uh, this donor will match every donation, every gift up to $10,000. So like if you're looking at that $25 level, if you give it that, that's 50 bucks you've just put towards this project. Maybe there's one of you that's like, I think I could swing the 2000, you know, subdeacon level. Um, well, if you swing it, that's going to be 4,000 we have for our project. And then we're, we're certainly going to hit our goal, you know? So, you know, we need 30,000 in just over a week and we have a matching donor giving up to 10,000 through Sunday at midnight. So, uh, tell your friends, uh, give now. We're at 41176 So every donation that comes in after that point, up to 10000 going to be matched. Now, here, oh, did you want to say something? Oh, go, go ahead, go ahead. So the, the last thing I'll say is what happens if we just completely blow through our goal? What if, what if we just raise like a quarter of a million dollars, you know? Um, well, here, here's what's going to happen. And here, here's like my plan is we don't just need one documentary. We need a series. Like we need the, the liturgy is such, such a complicated historical thing, a nuanced thing. It's such an important thing that we need time to investigate it. So like, if you just think about the qualities of the Latin mass, silence, mystery, tradition, Latin, each of those could be an episode, right? <laughs> Each of those could be its own film. We bring in the experts, we put our money towards the most beautiful cinematography. And if we blow past our goal, we're just gonna make more. We're just gonna do more. So it won't just be one documentary, um, as good as that's going to be, it's going to be just more. And I, I just want this to be the rest of my life. <laughs> I just wanna like promote the Latin mass and open up wide the doors to Latin mass, um, like come in, like, like we're, we're going to invite the Latin mass is the future. So I want to just 
show the typical Catholic the beauty and the power of the Latin Mass. And the, the documentary format is so powerful yeah. to be able to see that. And then it gets mass produced. Yep. It, it, I mean, the, the people need to understand this is why I'm, I, that's why I want you, ha- I want to have you on my show to help promote this effort because it is such an important thing, which will be so powerful and so, so uh, mass produced being able to be being replicated easily throughout the whole globe and make an enormous impact for the faith. And so, and, and into generations and gen- generations to come, this is something that I can, um, you can show children, you can show non-believers. Um, you know, this is something that people in Mohammedan countries can watch mm. this because they're, they're not allowed to look at a Bible but they can get on their phone and get some kind of uh, bootlegged version that their friend in Turkey gave them. <laughs> or, <something>. or they're <laughs> they're not the ones who are following the traditional channels online. Like the millions of Catholics I'm trying to reach, they're not the ones who are, you know, retweeting Dr. Taylor Marshall. I love Dr. Taylor Marshall. Um, they're not the ones who are just following these channels. We need to reach them. And a documentary is just the way in it's story first it's it's investigation that oh that that makes a good point (laughs) i haven't thought of that before they're open to receiving this information whereas when they're scrolling social media they're ready to like fight they're ready to like they have all these walls up um we all do so uh yeah imagine this landing on netflix one day like that's going to make a huge huge impact absolutely so any final words for us cameron Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm so hey, thank you so much for having me on. This I, I'm so glad you you had me on. Um, like you have a big audience, you, you have a lot of experts on to talk about really important things. I really appreciate you supporting this documentary. Uh, I think it's going to do a lot of good. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone, please go to theliturgy.org/kickstarter. You got it. It's in the show notes right below this video. You can go click on the link, donate as much as you can. Uh, this is such an important cause to donate. This is for your children and your children's children. It's up building the church. It's like, yeah, you, you can, you know, you can pay certainly, and please do pay to like restore your parish to be more traditional. You're like we should do that. This is going to like reach the people who don't even think to do that. This is going to show them what beautiful liturgy can be and why it's so important. So th- this giving to this is, is reaching so many people and with a, with a really powerful message. So yeah. Um, yeah. Matching gifts through Sunday night. And you can also dollars. click on the, the teaser video as well as below in the show notes. So take a look at that. So let's pray on our father to close us out and let's pray for the success of this effort and for the restoration of the liturgy. Let's pray reparation for all the blasphemies and ingratitude to our Lord and the blessed sacrament. Mm -hmm. And we pray, especially for the souls of our brethren, that they may be converted to the faith, converted to true devotion to the blessed sacrament Mm -hmm. and that tradition will be restored in the heart of the church and the heart of our children. Mm-hmm. Name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Name of the Father, the Son, the, Son, the Holy Jesus. Ghost. Um, Forgot to mention, 13 years since Sumorum Pontificum. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> I didn't even mention that. I know you wanted to end there, but... No, hey, that's, that's great. That's great. Thank yeah. you, Benedict the Sixteenth. <laughs> I would not have found the Latin Mass if it wasn't for you. <laughs> yes, 13-year anniversary. There it is. 7-7-2007. Excellent. That's the day. Excellent.